Welcome everyone to the Andrew Goodman Foundation's briefing, carrying the torch, bringing the spirit of 1964 into the fight for 2024. My name is Andrea Catone and I'll be your moderator today. As we've seen with recent youth turnout for the midterm elections, it's clear that we need to double down on our support for youth leadership, protecting voting rights and fighting voter suppression. 2022 has shown us that the youth of our country are a force to be reckoned with, and we need to invest in them now as they build forward. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from some of these young people in conversation with one another, as well as with AGF staff and board. Afterwards, you'll get the opportunity to join them in conversation as we move into facilitated breakout rooms. Before we get started, here are a few Zoom housekeeping notes. We ask you to please stay muted until the breakout portion of our time together, then we do encourage you to talk. And while everyone else is talking during the first part of our presentation today, we encourage you to use the chat as well as your Zoom reaction buttons to share your responses to what is being shared. We also ask everyone to be kind as well as respectful to the dignity of our speakers and to one another. Let's begin. I'm thrilled that we have Caroline Smith, the Andrew Goodman Foundation's program director with us today. After graduating from Connecticut College in 2018, Caroline began her organizing career at Rutgers University, Newark, and then jumped into national electoral work on Senator Cory Booker's presidential campaign for the 2020 primary cycle. Caroline is in her third year with AGF and is excited to continue working on um, with youth organizers across the country to institutionalize civic and voter engagement. And one of the things that I've noticed that differentiates the Andrew Goodman Foundation from its peers in the youth space is its history and its legacy. And Caroline, I'm wondering if you can kick us off and share a little bit more about the Andrew Goodman Foundation's history with us. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrea. Um, <clears throat> it's always a, an honor to share our legacy story. It's a really powerful one and definitely what brought me to AGF when I first joined. So um, when he was 21 years old, Andrew Goodman asked for his parents' permission to join the Freedom Summer of 1964, which happened at the height of the civil rights movement and um, in part when the Civil Rights Act was under attack by congregationists in, or, sorry, segregationists in Congress. Um, and it was a project to train and deploy volunteers from all across the country to register Black voters in Mississippi. Um, and it include, included, you know, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC, Congress of Racial Equity or CORE, and some others. So Andy was a junior at Queens College at the time, um, which is the same age as a lot of our Andrew Goodman ambassadors. Um, when he was recruited for Freedom Summer and he answered the call without question. His college essays at the time, which you can read through in some of our Andy archives, show that he was really becoming attuned to white apathy during the civil rights movement and kind of figuring out what his role should be in the fight for equity in the country. And so he dove in and he headed to what is now Miami University in Ohio for a series of intensive training alongside over a thousand other SNCC volunteers. And after the training, Andy was one of the first volunteers to go out, and he knew that he was embarking on an incredibly dangerous journey to investigate the burning of a church in Mississippi that had served as a freedom school, which was where voter registration meetings happened. And despite the danger that he knew was coming, he went um, and he drove down and he went with two veteran core workers, Michael Schwerner and James Earl Cheney. And I'm always shaken to read the letter that he sent to his parents when he arrived in Mississippi, because it feels like a letter that I definitely would have sent to my parents um, and just really kind of brings home who he was. So I just want to read it really quick. He said, Dear Mom and Dad, I have arrived safely in Meridian, Mississippi. This is a wonderful town and the weather is fine. I wish you were here. The people in the city are wonderful and our reception was very good. All my love, Andy. It was a handwritten letter. You can see pictures of it on our website. And it was the last time that his parents would hear from him. So together, Andy, James Earl, and Mickey made it to the church. They were arrested and detained by the local sheriff. 
They were then released. They were followed out of town and then they were promptly turned over to the KKK who brutally murdered all three men. Their bodies were buried and hidden so they weren't found for a painful 44 days that really shook the nation. So Andy, James Earl and Mickey's lives and deaths together struck a public chord that really rocked people across the country, but also contributed to the eventual passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which changed the voting landscape in the U.S. for decades, as we know, but still faces new attacks even today. In 1966, Andy's parents, Carolyn and Robert, created the Andrew Goodman Foundation in his honor, with a vision that young people will become active, engaged citizens who ensure a just democracy and sustainable future for everyone, very much in the same way that Andy, James Earl, and Mickey did in life and in death. And you'll get to hear more about AGF in our present and in our future, but first I'm happy to introduce our next speaker who can continue to ground us in this really powerful past. So I'm honored to have Robert Masters, the chair of the board of directors of the Andrew Goodman Foundation, Robert himself was a friend of Andy Goodman and also a fellow participant in Mississippi Freedom Summer. He spent his time in the city of Greenwood in the heart of the Delta. Robert, I'm grateful for the chance to chat with you today and always and learn from your stories. So can you share a bit more about what you and Andy experienced as Freedom Summer volunteers and, and what you knew of Andy? Sure. Thank you very much, Caroline. You did a a pretty good summary of, of what happened down there. Um, let me begin. So who was Andy Goodman? Andy was a 20-year-old white Jewish New Yorker. He lived in Manhattan on the Upper West Side, summered in the Adirondacks, and was a junior at Queens College. I was actually a sophomore at that time. Why and how did he go to Mississippi? Andy was recruited by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, along with almost a thousand other college students, including me, to go to Mississippi for the purpose of registering black citizens to vote, to staff freedom schools, and to bring national attention to the reality of life in Mississippi in 1964. Mississippi was a feudal state with a small elite on top and a vast underclass of serfs, both black and white. What training did Andy receive? What precautions were taken? During the spring of 64, Andy and I attended frequent meetings to learn about the realities of racism in Mississippi to learn of the dangers of opposing the order of things in Mississippi, to learn about the risks of exercising one's constitutional rights, such as the right to vote. All of the volunteers assembled in Ohio for a week of training. We did a lot of role playing. All of the volunteers, as well as the SNCC staff participated. One day you might play the role of a white person and the next day, the role of a black person, regardless of who you actually were. If you were playing the role of a black person or of a white sympathizer, the pretend mob would threaten you, verbally abuse you, and to some extent, physically attack you. The idea was to get us used to the risks, the physical risk, the mental risks, the psychological risks that we would face once we were down in Mississippi. There was a lot of discussions as well as the role playing that we went through. What were we doing? Who were we? Why were we doing this? What was the potential outcomes? What were the risks that we faced? There was no safety net. Our only safeguard was to live in the black communities where we were stationed. The police were our enemy. The FBI was useless. The FBI would always tell us there was nothing they could do. Their job was only to observe. How were Andy and his two colleagues murdered? Andy 
James Earl and Mickey were pulled over by the police in Philadelphia, Mississippi on trumped up charges. They were held for about eight hours, just long enough for the KKK to assemble a mob. Then they were released and caught again. The mob beat them, especially James Earl Cheney, and shot them. They were buried in an earthen dam and it took 44 days for the FBI to get an informant to tell where the bodies were. Every day that they hadn't found the bodies was another tough day for all of us down there. They um, transported Mickey Shorna's widow, Rita, from Meridian, where she had been stationed with Mickey, to Greenwood. So I would see her every day. She was basically working the phones, raising money for SNCC, for COFO, and trying to let everyone know about what happened and why they should pay attention to this. What happened? None of the murderers received an appropriate sentence. People asked Carolyn Goodman, Andy's mother, if she regretted giving her permission to Andy to participate in Freedom Summer. Her answer was, how could I say no? Andy was acting in accord with everything we believed and taught him. More importantly, the country became aware of how horrible things were in Mississippi. I believe that no one else was killed that summer because of the abhorrence felt around the country. Even more importantly, the revulsion people felt contributed to the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, one of the most important pieces of legislation in my lifetime. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Yael Bromberg. Yale serves as special counsel and strategic advisor to the AGF, supporting our organizing advocacy and legal efforts. She's a principal of Bromberg Law LLC. She's one of the nation's foremost legal experts on the 26th Amendment, the Youth Voting Amendment to the Constitution. Yale has worked with AGF for a number of years, and it's been my pleasure to know her um, and see the work that she's accomplished. Yael, you have spearheaded a number of interesting voting rights projects with the AGF in the past. What has your attention now? Thank you, Robert. And it's such a pleasure and always a privilege to be here in the AGF space um, and to hear the story specifically from our legacy and origin because they really do chart us forward um, and ground us. And I say this often, but it's true. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and Robert, we really appreciate you sharing with us the, the story, especially for me, the new piece. I always learn something new, uh, <clears throat> including, including Rita Schorner's um, engagement with you and kind of continued um, efforts with you in Mississippi um, during those kind of horrendous days following the assassination. Um, and we had, I know we had David Goodman join us last night as well. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here with the wider network of AGF um, and bring new voices um, into the discussion. I look forward to joining you all in the breakout group afterwards as well. Um, so the question is, what happened at this midterm and how does it inform and shape our understanding of this current moment? And I think that we are at a tipping point. <clears throat> this was the first election that was run post-insurrection when so many election deniers were vying for the ticket, um, in many cases losing um, their bids for office. And of course, we had the news <clears throat> just last night of a new uh, announced candidacy for president, um, which came after our um, evening uh, discussion yesterday. 
And I think the narrative of the 20 of the 2022 election is that, um, you know, the untapped power of youth and the weakness of election denialism and the engagement that we know that young people, when they come to vote, they vote based on their issues, that they're increasingly independent voters. They increasingly eschew traditional party affiliations um, or institutional identities beyond just partisan politics. Um, so we really are at a tipping point. Young people came up as they always do and flexed their muscle and exercised their power at the polling location um, and showed their electoral power. If you look at um, some of the battleground races, young people shape the results across the country. The net uh, votes attributed to youth in certain elections tr uh, tripled even the margin. So for example, that was the case in the Georgia Senate race and the Arizona gubernatorial race. Um, and in the Wisconsin gubernatorial race, although it did not triple, it was on par with the election margin. And that bears true with our what we continuously see in the field. Um, for example, in Florida, we work to overturn a state ban on the availability to vote early on campus. Uh, we brought presidential 26th Amendment litigation with regard to that. And when we studied the impact, we saw that young people availed themselves of that new expanded election mechanism by 60,000 new votes, which had a significantly, statistically significant impact on the margin and in that related race in 2020. And bringing us forward to 2022, we see this trend continue to be on par. Uh, the net youth votes compared to the vote uh, margin of races, and if it's the um, Pennsylvania Senate, the Georgia Senate, um, yet again, just as we saw in 2020, when young people saved democracy, uh, particularly young people from Georgia, if it were not for them, and I keep saying this, <laughs> but sometimes things happen and we take it for granted, um, and we don't think back of how, how this occurred, but if it had not been for the demonstrated power of Georgian youth in the 2020 election, we would not be where we are today. Rule of law would be something that would be continued to be deteriorated, right? And we certainly would not have been able to welcome the first black woman onto the United States Circuit, uh, onto the United States Supreme um, Court. And so we continue to see many new firsts with the 2022 race. Uh, Maxwell Alejandro Frost was the first ever member of Gen Z elected to the US House of Representatives out of Florida. He was an organizer um, with March for Our Lives. Um, we saw the first Black American elected as governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, governor-elect Wes Moore. Uh, Maura Healy was the first ever openly lesbian woman elected as governor for Massachusetts. Philip Ensler, first Jewish American elected to the Alabama House, Alabama. <laughs> and the list goes on and on. Um, for in Illinois, Delia Ramirez was the first Latina representative in Congress. And we saw time and time again that young people um, and states and voters um, sought to protect reproductive rights in their states. They voted against outlawing abortions in Kentucky, Vermont, Michigan, and Colorado, and um, California. And there were other new uh, highlights that came out of 2022 as well. For example, just on the preliminary results um, based on the vote by mail reliance, we're already seeing expanded use of vote by mail mechanisms compared to the last midterm election, which of course had predated um, the pandemic. And we worked really hard during the pandemic to ensure ease of access, um, including vote by mail. And so what I'm anticipating is this continued embrace of common sense modernization tools for elections. And just like Lonnie Guinier, <laughs> um, beloved um, constitutional theorist, um, a kind of an innovative theorist in terms of the tyranny of the majority, she said that Black voters were the canaries in the, in the coal mine with regard to voting rights and their ability. And it wasn't specifically about Black voters, actually, she was talking about um, minority power in general. Um, and what that, which the way that she contemplated that was subsections of the population who had not been a part of determining the majority rule itself. 
And young people are in the same way. They are canaries in the coal mine with regard to where the targets are for a specific uh, protected class and vulnerable class of voters. And we work really hard to ensure their expanded protections. For example, we were called upon um, to do expanded work in Georgia in 2020, um, and again in 2022 for the general and the runoff targeted for young people. We ensured that 90,000 students in Fulton County had access to on-campus polling locations leading up to the general election. We scaffolded up a rapid response, which was successful um, in August to ensure that access in November. And we were again called upon by the field to ensure the continuity of that um, leading up to the runoff as well. We changed the law statewide in New York to mandate on-campus polling locations, which will be a, which was a new mandate put into place this year, um, and also to outlaw campus gerrymanders. And all of this, this advocacy slash litigation piece is very much informed by the field, by what our organizers tell us they want um, and how we leverage best practices, right? Because we know the field knows the work. So if there's an astrophysics, um, student who's an Andrew Goodman ambassador out of Florida that calls our attention on something and says, hey, we need your support, then we step in to offer that type of surgical support, as well as from Alabama or Arizona or New York or wherever the case might be. Um, and so we saw in the 2020 race, 2022 races, that young people were interested um, and advocating for removal of obstacles to uh, electoral mechanisms and we're working hard to not only um, boost the positivity of you know making voting fun and encouraging and institutionalized but also to remove obstacles um, as they present themselves and and the youth vote bore that out and what we're really excited to do is to continue to see that trend leading up to 2024 and also to contribute to a 15 and 20 year vision for what youth voting rights looks like which really makes us unique in the field. Um, so I'm going to hand this off to the next speaker. Again, it's a pleasure to be able to join in conversation with you all. I look forward to hearing with you um, from you in the um, subsequent breakout. Um, and I'll drop some links as well um, to highlight some of the work that we do. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kaylee Valencia uh, as our next speaker. She's the program manager. She's working directly with our students in the field. Uh, she's a program manage manager and operations strategist at AGF. She's a graduate of Louisiana State University, where we've done a lot of good work um, in the past as well. And Kaylee holds a bachelor degree in political science. Her passions include creativity, civic engagement, social justice, and community building. And one of the unique things that Kaylee really brings into the space is her enthusiasm um, to work with young people and to kind of level level up, um, you know, our our what we call our vote everywhere um, docket. So Kaylee, I have a I have a question for you as I as I tee it up, which is, what's coming next for our AGF ambassadors, and why does AGF? Why do you believe that AGF invests in young people? Thank you so much for the introduction and all of your wonderful remarks. We've had the incredible opportunity and privilege to hear more about the Andrew Goodman Foundation's history and how the work that we're doing currently both tackles today's issues and connects to the legacy of the civil rights movement. We've also ha had the opportunity to hear about how our ambassadors continue to honor the Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner legacy by doing their work to mobilize young people and ensure a just democracy and sustainable future. And I'm here to specifically talk about the future portion. But I'd first like to bring you in on why the Andrew Goodman Foundation invests so heavily into youth. The generation of young people has been mobilized by their experiences coming of age amidst an increasingly urgent crisis such as climate change, reopen debates on reproductive justice, and even direct attacks on our democracy itself. The Andrew Goodman Foundation invests in youth because they are actively working to change the civic culture both on their campuses and in their communities, which in turn has a profound impact on the state of democracy in our nation. All in all, as Ayel said, we are in a tipping point in our country. The youth vote has continually surged in each election and we can expect even more heading into 2024 and the elections to come. AGF is committed to energizing, engaging, and empowering students, as well as removing obstacles participating fully in our democracy. 
And I'm sure you've all seen the incredible statistics that came out from the midterms that happened just last week. While the data is still coming in, Circle can estimate that the 2022 youth turnout is the second highest turnout for a midterm election in the past 30 years. The midterm youth vote sent a resounding message about protecting our democracy from anti-democratic forces. Our work includes empowering and supporting students and young people to take on these challenges. And something that is incredibly special to me about AGF's organizing is that it is local and caters to the political, geographical, and cultural context at each campus we engage in. But we also have the leverage and resources of a nationwide organization. I see this every day as I work with my different campuses across the country and the unique models that they employ to mobilize their campuses. AGF is training and supporting students and young people to become the civic leaders of our future that we so desperately need. We know that for many, organizing and activist work is a privilege. To affect meaningful change is both time and resource intensive. By empowering each student with direct financial, educational, and institutional support, our program works to build an inclusive coalition of student leaders that requires no prior knowledge, experience, or resources. This is perhaps the most important work that we can do for our future, supporting and engaging young people now. Students in our program are able to take their experiences and what they learn in our program and in turn apply it to their communities for generations and empower leaders. They are the problem solvers and community builders of our future that we can all count on. As for what's next for AGF, folks can expect innovative, future-oriented projects and programs such as campuses integrating democracy into their campus routines and access like election day as a holiday, having polling places on their campuses and institutionalizing voter registration practices. Our students are also working to create dynamic hubs for civic engagement and education on their campuses through robust institutional support of civic education. We also have groundbreaking digital support coming up with our app creation, our tailored pages to each campus that we engage in, and all of the digital resources that we spend a lot of time creating and putting our effort into. So I spent a lot of time talking about how important it is for us to continue to support students and young people. I highlight this specifically because the impact on our future that investing into building a diverse and inclusive foundation of civic leaders today simply cannot be overstated. If we want to see progress in the future, that work begins now. And so I am proud to introduce you to the future, a few of our very own Andrew Goodman ambassadors to give you insight on their work and to help you draw a line to the impact that we can see in 2024. Beginning with Chandler, Chandler is a senior English major at Spelman College from Washington, D.C. Before beginning her matriculation at Spelman, she earned her Associate of Arts degree in high school from the George Washington University. She is a fellow of the Spelman Social Justice Program, an Andrew Gibbon Foundation Ambassador, and a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She also currently serves as the 81st President of the Spelman Student Government Association. And after graduation, she intends to pursue a fellowship program focusing on policy development. Thank you for being here, Chandler. The second ambassador that I would like to introduce you to is Haley. Haley is a sophomore at Pace University majoring in health science on a pre-physician assistant track. Haley's passion for civic engagement began when she was young and has only grown over time through her involvement in various clubs and organizations on campus. As a STEM major, one of Haley's goals during her time as an Andrew Gibbon ambassador is to motivate her fellow STEM and pre-health majors to be civically engaged. My first question will be for Chandler. Chandler, what inspires you to continue to do this work despite consistent obstacles presenting themselves for Georgia and for Spelman specifically? Thank you, Kaylee, so much for that introduction. Um, what inspires me personally is the constant enthusiasm that Spelman College students have towards democracy and towards being civic, towards being civically engaged, excuse me, um, despite the many obstacles that we face uh, being students here in Georgia. Um, there are many challenges that we oftentimes will have being that Spelman College is a private institution. Um, so we are not able to use our student IDs, for example, um, unlike our peers at say 
Georgia Tech or Georgia State um, who are able to vote using their student IDs. Spelman students are not able to do that. Um, so those do challenges like that do impose certain um, barriers that make it difficult for Spelman students to vote. Um, voter confusion may arise due to challenges in determining polling location and acceptable forms of ID. But notwithstanding all of that, Spelmanites overwhelmingly are ecstatic um, every time there is an election season and even when there are off seasons um, there is an overwhelming desire to disseminate the information regarding civic engagement um, and regarding how we can be advocates within Georgia even those who are out of state students like myself I'm not from Georgia I'm born and raised in Washington DC um, but all of us have come to Atlanta and come to the West End community um, and that being our new home um, for the four, for the four years that we spend at Spelman College um, and we have very much taken uh, this community in as our own home and treat it uh, with a personal level of accountability to make sure that Georgia is able to show up in the way that it needs to, um, to benefit not just college students like us who are, you know, here, we may leave um, even after the four years, but for those who are lifelong residents, um, we all treat Georgia and Atlanta as our community. Um, and so whether it is through the uh, presentation sessions that I'll give in first year classrooms to inform those 19, 18 year olds of how they can get registered to vote all the way to uh, uh, candidate forms that we'll have inviting local candidates into Spelman College's campus to speak. Students always have a myriad of questions that they wanna ask um, about voter registration, about candidates. Um, and that is what inspires me. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing more about your work on Spelman's campus and in Atlanta. My second question will be for Haley. Haley, can you tell us more about how your team is working to change the civic culture on your campus? Yeah, so first, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So some exciting ways that our team is working on changing the civic culture on our campus is by presenting to first year introductory courses to register, you know, incoming and new pay students, and also holding events targeted towards majors who vote at low rates on pay at pace. Um, another exciting way is that we were able to make election day a holiday at pace so that more students are able to get out and vote. Um, currently, we have asynchronous days approved for Election Day for fall 2023 and 2024. The university also recently sent out a survey to gather thoughts about the academic calendar beyond 2024. So we were able to mobilize some of our campus partners to rank Election Day as like a high priority for the future academic calendar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, I know Andrea will introduce in a second, but we have an upcoming breakout room with both Chandler and Haley, and you can hear more about their incredible work that is coming up there. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Kaylee, and thank you, Chandler and Haley, and to all of our speakers so far today. Thank you again to Caroline, Yael, and Robert. Um, we appreciate you. And we're excited to be able to invite everyone who's here into the conversation. Um, we're going to open up breakout rooms in just a moment. There are going to be three different breakout rooms. There will be one for the past, one for the present, and one for the future. And in each of those breakout rooms, you'd have the chance to engage and talk with and be in conversation with not only others who are attending this call, but also the speakers that were in that session. Uh, that section of the session. So I'm um, going to ask Hope to open those breakout rooms and I'm going to explain a little bit more about how to join them in case it's your first time too. If you scroll and hover down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a symbol that says breakout rooms. You should be able to click that and you should be able to join, hit join for the breakout room you'd like to attend. And if you have any difficulty joining a room, just go ahead and put in the chat the name of the room that you would like to be added to, and we can add you right away. Um, you can also shout it out. We're happy to, to help you get in there. So I'm going to go ahead and play some music. We'll be in those breakout rooms for approximately 15 minutes or so, and enjoy your conversation. Thank you. And welcome back, everyone. We are all back together, whether we were ready or not. Um, so I, I definitely encourage you, if you're in the middle of a conversation or a learning um, or, you know, had met someone you want to keep talking to, you can reach out to us. We'll help you make that happen. 
we want to keep um, the energy, the community, the conversation, the hope going. And I just want to also thank each and every one of you for taking time today to join our briefing. Um, we all have so much going on and, and appreciate you taking the hour to be with us today. I want to also thank all of our speakers, as well as all of our AGF student ambassadors and fellow youth organizers across the country. And a big thank you to the AGF staff for making today possible. And now it's our turn. I want to turn to everyone, all of us who are joining in and listening to these stories, learning about what we can do to save our democracy and to protect and expand voting rights and access. And now it's our turn. We invite you to learn about how you can help. Ashanti from the development team is sharing a website in the chat, bit.ly slash support AGF today, where you can visit right now and learn how you can get involved. And we really do need each and every one of us to make this work happen. We encourage you to support the Andrew Goodman Foundation while we invest in our young people and their leadership as they do protect our democracy and expand voting rights and access. Please click on the link in the chat before you head out today. And again, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash support AGF today. And get started now. We need you and we're also here to help you get started. So thank you again. And here's to our young people and to the future. Take care.